J. Ellsworth Callas. And Callas has written several books that are called From the Backside. And these are books that take well-known subjects like the Ten Commandments or the Parables of Jesus and look at them from a different angle, uh, an angle that we're not particularly used to in order to help us understand their true meaning. And I highly recommend his books. J. Ellsworth Callas. Um, the book I'm talking about today is about the Beatitudes. And so it's called The Beatitudes from the Backside. Um, in the introduction to this book, he explained why this book was more difficult to write than the others he'd written from the backside. Um, he said it's because within the first sentence, we're already looking at things in a manner utterly at odds with our usual outlook on life. He's talking about the Beatitudes. They are already looking at things from an, a manner utterly at odds with our usual outlook on life. From where we generally live out our lives, the Beatitudes seem so contrary as to be coming from the backside. Sometimes it's probably not a bad idea to remember that a lot of the teachings of the Gospels really are different from what we have been taught by others and are contrary to our expectations. When it comes to Jesus, perhaps the first really is last and the least among us truly are the greatest. So as you can see, when Jesus says these things, he is helping us to see life from the opposite direction that life has often taught us already. So let's think about this as we prepare for today's worship service, um, and let us pray. Teach us gentleness, O Lord, that in you and you alone we may seek our strength. Amen. Amen. Let's settle in now, and let's listen to Anne play the prelude as we prepare for worship.
for your blessing in times. We do not ask for blessings as the world understands them, but for the blessing of belonging to your kingdom. May today's worship open our ears to the cries of those who are sad. Open our hearts to the needs of the poor and open our hands to serve the hungry. In this way, we will be blessed by doing your will. These things we ask in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Going to. I didn't know such a thing was possible. 
So we'll pray for Teresa. Um, we've been praying for a couple of months now for Kathy, um, who is Bob Penrod's sister who's been living with Alzheimer's and she has just died. So we want to give prayers for Bob's family and give thanks for Kathy's life. Um, we also had news of the death of um, the death of a former, or the daughter of a former pastor um, here. Can somebody share the details? Um, I forgot her name, I'm sorry. The daughter of Paul Durbin. I think Paul was a an interim before Chris McCray. So we, I know he's well thought of here, so we want to um, pray for um, Paul and his family after the death of their daughter, and we put the details in the, in the bellwether this week. Um, Con, Connie and Ron are requesting prayer for their son, Mark Hamilton, um, who's, who continues to go through a very rough time, as do Ron and Connie. Um, and the sunflowers that are on the on the Lord's table remind us to keep praying for Ukraine and all other people who are living with war or the threat of war. We'll have a silence later on in the prayer, so let's bow our heads at this point, and I'll offer up to God a pastoral prayer. God of our lives gentle and loving creator of all that is. We bow before you this morning to praise you for your greatness and to thank you for all our blessings. We have nothing that does not come from you. And whatever we possess, or at least think we possess, is on loan because we are but stewards of your goodness. So help us, we pray, to share what what's in our power to share and, and to guard what's in our power to protect. And in all things, may we give you the glory. O God, ever present and all-knowing guide, we bow before you to seek direction. May our worship service bring us closer to you that we may more clearly see your face. And as your word is shared in our midst, may we discern your will and share your unconditional grace and radical welcome with those to whom love is a stranger. And may we also pray for those for whom acceptance is but a far-off dream. O God, omnipotent and invincible Savior, we bow before you to ask for healing. We seek the wholeness that has eluded us in our possessions and in our human relationships. And we pray for those in our lives who are suffering. Restore us to life according to your will. Comfort us in the knowledge that we are completed in your love. Holy God, ever ready to listen to our wants and our needs and our desires, hear us now as in the silence of this sanctuary we lay before your throne our joys and concerns. Thank you, O oh God, for being there, and thank you even more for being here. All that we have prayed has been offered up to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, God forevermore. Amen. This morning's scripture reading comes from the letter of James, chapter 1, verses 19 through 
27. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For your danger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome the meekness, the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word, and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves, and on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. <coughs> if any think they are religious and do not write all their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. Take care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself sustained by the world. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please stand for our next hymn. <laughs> Yazoo, Yazoo, located on page 600, stanzas 1, 2, and 4.
generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. Now, I think I told you last week that I've been to the, the eye doctor, and I complained to the eye doctor that I had to take off my glasses in order to read, and maybe I should do something about that with bifocals. And the eye doctor informed me that apparently it was strictly psychological, that I could see just as well with the glasses on up close as I could with the glasses off. So I have new glasses now, and I'm going to try to conduct worship with my glasses on. We'll see how this works. So, in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, Paul lists nine fruits of the Spirit. And today we have reached number eight. And the Greek word for today's fruit of the Spirit is praotes. And the most common transli translation of this word, at least in contemporary translations of the Bible, is gentleness. And the second most common translation, and this one's especially popular in older versions of the Bible, is meekness. And coming in at number three in popularity is the word humility. So those are the top three ways to translate praotes. It's gentleness, and then meekness, and then humility. And you can see how all of those words are related, and I will not take issue with that translation in my Bible. Um, but today we're going to stick with the top two um, translations of that word, gentleness and meekness. And I'm going to treat both of them sort of equally in today's sermon. And it's easy to see how this word um, can mean both of these things. But the way I think about it, gentle is a word that I might use in everyday conversation, while meek is probably more of a theological word, more of a a more biblical, Old Testament kind of word. Meekness in the scriptures, and it's mentioned frequently, it's almost always positive. It's almost always a good thing. The first two references I think of, in fact, are overwhelmingly positive in the Bible. One of them um, is from the Old Testament and the other from the New, and they say almost the exact same thing. One seems to be uh, quotation of the other. So the first one is in the Old Testament, Psalm 37, 11, which tells us that the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. And then there's Matthew 5, 5. At the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, this is the third beatitude, and Jesus here says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. So you can see that those two are almost exactly the same. And the Psalms, the psalmist says the meek will inherit the land. And in the New Testament, Jesus says they will inherit the earth. Earth and land sometimes are the same word translated differently. Both of these are, of course, lovely sayings, but I don't think we give them enough thought. I don't know how it was for the ancient Hebrews exactly, or for the Jews of Jesus' day, but in our culture, we are not taught to be meek. We're usually taught the opposite, in fact. We're taught to stand up for ourselves. The meek have trouble merging in traffic. The meek are likely to lose their place in line. The meek get scammed. Those are things we don't want to happen to us, and so we don't teach meekness too often, and we don't teach our children to be especially meek. We teach them to stand up for themselves. And why is this? I think the answer is kind of obvious, but in case it's not, remember that the Bible was not written for the proud or the powerful. And so this meekness that's mentioned in the Bible is not necessarily something that was intended for, for us or for people that live our lives the way that we do. Remember that the Bible was written not for the proud and the powerful, 
because most of its, for most of its history, Israel was the underdog. They would have been the people in the world that would have been considered meek. The Bible at one point calls Israel the least of all people. The scriptures were intended first to give them an identity and to knit them together into a people. But second, the words of Scripture were intended to assure not the great and powerful, but to assure the downtrodden that they were not forgotten. Sometimes the words of Scripture, especially about meekness, were addressed to the entire nation, and sometimes they were addressed to those within Israel who were outcasts in their own society. And so when the psalmist reminds them and everybody else that their lives were not meaningless, that God still had plans for them, promises to be fulfilled, that God still had a future for them. But by the time Jesus came on the scene, Israel's glory as a world power was behind them. If this was true in Judea and Jerusalem, where, of course, the Roman emperor wielded ultimate power, and then how much more true was it for Galilee, that little area up north that was considered a backwater? People up there might have been the hillbillies of their day. That was where Jesus was from, and that's where Jesus was preaching the Sermon on the Mount and first proclaiming these Beatitudes. And of those who followed Jesus early on, the majority of them, probably the vast majority, maybe even all of them, were those who were most likely to lose their place in line, who would be looked upon as the meek of the earth. And so when Jesus repeated a promise, almost word for word, as it was found in the Psalms, that the meek would inherit the land or would inherit the earth, then they would have heard this beatitude in a very different way from what we probably do as 21st century Americans. What they would have heard was that here was a teacher who believed that this world was not just a playground for the rich and the powerful. They probably heard a teacher who believed that wealth was not a sign of God's blessing, which is what most people in that day believed. If you were wealthy, then God loved you, and if you were poor, then God had probably turned God's back on. What they heard was that God loved the poor and the persecuted and the meek, and that God had promises for them too. So the same Greek word that's translated as gentleness in the list of the fruit of the Spirit is the same one that's translated as meek in the Beatitudes. So when we read that in Galatians, we can easily transfer that back to the Beatitudes that, that we have all heard much earlier on, and know that that's the same word, or at least a, a form of the same word. And it's the same word that James used in today's scripture reading that Steve read a few minutes ago when he said, welcome with meekness, the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. And I think that's the key this morning to understanding this word as one of the fruits of the Spirit. If we think about that verse, then we probably have to admit that what it's saying is pretty self-explanatory. It's pretty obvious. God's message has been planted within us, and if we hope to embrace it or welcome it, as, as James said, we have to do it with a certain attitude. So what would that attitude be? Would it be an attitude of power? If the Word has the power to save us, then thinking we have any power over the Word is basically nonsense. How about a, an attitude of pride? Once again, if it's the Word that saves us, then any pride in ourselves is going to be counterproductive. The attitude that the Apostle James tells us we need is an attitude of meekness or gentleness or humility. And when you think about what he's saying, it's clear that this is really the only attitude that could possibly work. 
if our goal is to welcome God's word. Pride or power will always get in the way of, of the message that God has, has to share with us. Any sort of selfishness that might be in control of who we are, who I am, would make it basically impossible to hear what God wants me to hear. If I think I have the power to save myself, if I'm proud of my power, then I'm not going to be able to understand what God's message is. But meekness, or gentleness, or humility, these allow me to understand that I don't know it all, and that I am not in charge of God's message. So, the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. And this is probably one of the most underrated of all of the fruits of the Spirit. Now, a lot of times things are underrated because they're, they're everywhere. They're so common that we don't even notice them. But gentleness, I think, is underrated because it's something we suppress. It's not everywhere these days. We advise against it. We think it make, makes things too difficult. But living with meekness or gentleness is something that I think the world needs right now. Sometimes I think it's pretty obvious because there's so much anger out there right now that people's minds seem to go straight to vengeance these days. People think they have been wronged and so their minds go straight to how they can get back at the person who has wronged them. I'll give an example that I think we all know about. Hopefully we don't participate in it, but it's possible that somebody out there does. Let's imagine that we're on the interstate. Somebody cuts you off in traffic. Now chances are nearly zero that this person who did this knows you, knows who you are, or did this in any way on purpose to get at you. They did it almost always by accident. They simply weren't paying enough attention. But there are so many people these days who think that retribution is necessary when they experience this on the road. This is so common that we have a term for it, and everybody in this room knows the term. If I ask you to say it out loud, you probably all tell me it's road rage. We all know that. Now, we might joke about road rage, but the fact is that it's extremely dangerous and sometimes even deadly. Horrible things happen because of road rage. And if you ask me, Christians can't really participate in this kind of behavior because the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. When somebody cuts us off in traffic or refuses to yield to us and let us in when we think we have right to merge into traffic. The gentle way of responding is probably the best. The gentle way of responding might be just to hold off or to slow down, to let that other person have their way for that moment. Because getting back at them makes absolutely no sense. It makes no one safer. And it solves no problems. It simply creates more anger in a world that's already too angry. As common as road rage is, there's an arrogance in, in everyday conversation in our culture that's probably much more dangerous to us all in the end than any road rage is. The idea that listening to somebody that we might disagree with being a sign of weakness, and that's a huge idea that's out in the world right now, that even the hint of compromise is wrong, this has ruined relationships. And it's tied our country in knots, perhaps even the whole world. If we instead reminded ourselves that the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness, we could probably better listen to one another or simply avoid that which we know would cause animosity. Now maybe when I mention this, our minds automatically turn to politics, but it's also just as prevalent in religion. Remember that Jesus loved people, and Jesus listened to them. 
unless he knew somebody was a stubborn hypocrite, Jesus only ever used gentleness to deal with anybody, even with people he disagreed with. And I hope that this is the way most of us deal with other people. But we know that churches can be just as bad as any other organization or any other person when it comes to a refusal to be gentle or meek or humble. If it's true that the other fruits of the Spirit are a matter of choice, and that's sort of what I've been preaching for this series, that the fruits of the Spirit are things that we can choose to do or not do, that if we do choose to do them, that the practice of them can become a habit in our lives, then how much more true this must be of gentleness. We can train our minds and our hearts to respond to difficulty to respond to disagreement with gentleness. We listen. We forgive. We choose mild words to respond to angry words. And just as we cannot welcome God's word with an attitude of arrogance, we cannot embrace a brother or a sister or a neighbor or even an enemy if we do not adopt an attitude of gentleness or humility. Now the kingdom of God may exist all around us, but we cannot enter it if our attitude places us above other people. The fruit of the Spirit is indeed gentleness or meekness. And the Bible tells me that the real future lies in the hands of the meek. So may all of us prepare for the future by being gentle in all our dealings. Amen. Let's remain seated for our next hymn. It's number 102, Jesus, the Very Thought of Thee, number 102, and we'll sing hymn, or verses 1, 3, and 4.
Left to our own devices, Lord, we would close our hearts and minds. So thank you for opening our ears to your gospel and our hands to do your will. Accept our gifts and use them to strengthen the church and to serve our neighbors in the world around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Go forth into the world as God's beloved people, and with gentleness of speech and meekness of bearing, let others see not your self-confidence, but your trust in the greatness of the one in whose name you are sent, God, the Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.